Hi everyone, welcome to today's episode of What's a Crime with Gronya and Gemma. So today's story, we are talking about Mark Kilroy. He's kind of your all-American boy that went missing in Mexico in 1989. So just to prepare yourself and our listeners, this is quite a graphic story. Okay. So yeah, just so that you know, you're aware. Yep. So let's get started. (laughs) In March 1989, four college friends have finished their exams at Texas A&M University. Mark Kilroy was a junior pre-med major at the University of Texas. Bradley Murr was a sophomore electrical engineering major at Texas A&M University. So before college, they had been basketball teammates and buddies. And then they had both gone to spring break the year prior, but not together. So this time they decide they're going to go together. They go on to pick up two of their other friends, Bradley Murr and Brent Martin. So Mark, Bradley and Brent had played basketball and Mark and Bill had played baseball. So all four of these boys were like athletic. They were clean cut. They didn't use drugs. They were serious students. They were the kind of boys that you would want your daughter to date. Type of boys I picture whenever you watched these American movies. Yeah, exactly. You know, going to spring break. Yeah. Used to always want to go to spring break. Always. Like, you know, the pool parties and (laughs) stuff. Didn't it look so fun? So they, like thousands of other college students, were going to party at the Tex-Mex border for spring break. So they drove the 600 kilometer, nine hour journey to South Padre Island. They arrived sometime around dawn and there was thousands of other students there, you know, getting ready to drink and party and have a good time. There was loads of events. There was like beer sponsors, um, entertainment events, movies, um, music concerts, and like bikini competitions. <laughs> well, we all know who would be in a bikini competition if you were there. Who <laughs> would be trying to get up on the stage? <laughs> okay, so Mark was eager to meet a girl. He was single. He was described by his friends as outgoing. He liked to tell stories and liked to get everybody laughing. And he was also quite athletic and attractive as well. So, you know, he'd be a good catch. Yep. The next day, on the 14th of March, they decided they would cross the Mexican border. So the real pull of crossing the border was obviously that they could drink underage and the drink would be cheaper as well. So Mark is actually 21 at this time, but not all of the boys are. So they you know, would need fake IDs and yeah. stuff. So they drove the short 50 kilometer drive to the border. They parked their car at Brownsville and made the short walk to Matamoros. So that night, Matamoros was flooded with tourists from the U.S., Thousands of people lined the streets drinking and dancing. It was just like a real sort of crazy yeah. nightclub vibe everywhere. It was so busy. So they spent the night drinking and dancing. The nightclubs were wild and packed and they just like danced the night away, had fun, flirted with girls. Mark was chatting with one of the girls that won the bikini contest the day before and they were getting friendly. And then at around 2 a.m., Billy was starting to get tired. So it was like a two-day binge. Yeah. And, you know, you could do it at that age. So he tells the others that he thinks he's going to throw in the towel and they all decide to leave together. They only have a short walk back to the car. It's only like a couple hundred yards to the border, to the International Bridge, so that they could get back to the U.S. and back to their hotel. Yeah. So at this point... There are crowds of people dispersing and heading in different directions. They're all kind of either making their way back to the border or where they came from, and the boys get split up. So Brent and Bradley, they walk on. Mark stops to say bye to the girl that he had been chatting to, the girl that won the missed handling competition. The girl that you would have been jealous <laughs> of. I was going to say the girl that I would have been. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Debatable. But. <laughs> so... Um, Billy decides to run down an alleyway to do a quick pee and then when he comes back Mark is nowhere to be seen so it wasn't like Mark to leave his friends so Billy is kind of like you know kind of wonders where he got to and he runs up to catch up with the other two boys and Mark is not with them either so they think that even though it was uncharacteristic, he might have already crossed the border and walked to the car on his own. So they decide to cross the border and walk there, but he's not waiting for them at the car. So at this point, they are getting worried because the last time they'd seen him, he had been talking to that girl and it was like he just vanished. 
So they decide to cross back into Mexico, into Matamoros, and look for him. At this point, like, yes, there was thousands of people lying in the street drinking and dancing earlier, but at this time, it's like a ghost town. Everybody just kind of, you know, dispersed really quickly. It's... It's not, I was going to say it's funny, but it's not, it's that they got so worried about him that quickly. I mean, I mean, it shows what kind of friend group yeah, they are. He wouldn't have, been, have left them. Yeah, it must have been really out of his character to do that. Because, I mean, they're all out, they're drinking, he's yeah. talking to a girl. A lot of people would have just presumed, right, he's gone back to some party with and this And I also noticed how when one of the boys said, I'm tired, I think we should call in a towel. They all went they home all, together. They all decided to go yeah. together. Like, yeah. it really kind of shows what kind of group that they were. And they're quite responsible. Yeah. So... They are looking for him now in Matamoros. They're coming the streets and they can't find him anywhere. They check toilets, street corners and anywhere that was still open. But it was like he had just vanished. They're now really worried something bad has happened to him. So they kind of don't really know what to do at this point. So they cross the border and go back to their hotel on San Padre Island. The next morning they are waking up and they're starting to come around from the night before. And it's kind of around noon when they're all starting starting to wake up and they realise that Mark's bed wasn't slept in. He still hadn't come home and there was still no word for him. So they kind of thought, all right, maybe he might be somewhere and he'll just come back to the the middle of the night. And he didn't. And that's when they really start to panic. Brett suggested that maybe he got into trouble with the police and got arrested and thrown in jail. So that would sort of explain why he wasn't on the streets whenever they went back to find him. So once again, they cross the border to check with the local police. They call into a police station and explain the situation. Now, the authorities don't really take them seriously at all. This sort of thing that you can imagine around yeah, spring definitely. break happens all the time. Yeah. You know, American tourists And it really drunk. has just been one night and not even a full night. It's basically a matter of hours, is it? Really? Because by the time they got home. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, I'm sure a lot of people wake up like on a beach somewhere yeah. or in a hotel room or whatever. And they're kind of just like, oh, he'll be fine. But the boys know that that's not like Mark. So they're deflated, exhausted, and quite scared. They don't really know what else to do. So again, cross the border back into Brownsville, which is the US, yep. and call into Brownsville police station to report Mark missing. So the detective that takes the report is called George Gavito. He immediately knows that the first 48 hours to 72 hours are critical in the search for Mark. So he sort of takes in the situation and he can see that Mark does not fit the profile for a runaway. He's like, you're all American boy, studying pre-med and he was a serious student, a frequent church goer. He didn't do drugs. His parents were well-respected members of the community. So he takes it seriously straight away. He immediately either thinks... This guy is either dead or has been kidnapped. Also, I find it crazy how he took it serious straight away. I know, I know. Because, but like, I, like, I think he's just, I, he's yeah. probably just one of these really serious officers yeah. and he just knows, sort of taking all these things into account. That evening, the boys decide to make the heartbreaking phone call to Mark's parents. James and Helen receive the phone call that every parent dreads to hear in their life. I actually watched a documentary about this and obviously this happened in 1996. So the boys are are grown men now. But even when they sort of recalled that memory, they got emotional. Like you just... Of telling the parents. Of telling the parents. Like you can't imagine how sad and heartbreaking that must have been for them. And fearful. And 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 so scary. So 48 hours later, investigators on both sides of the border form a task force to search for Mark. They search jails, hospitals, hotels, morgues, but there is not a trace of Mark. It's like he was there one minute and vanished into thin air the next. So the investigators quiz the boys to see if they can remember any details of that night that might help them narrow down Mark's final movements. Have they ever thought of the girl or the... I, I I think that she was sort of talking to him, but she had left as well. I think okay. that Billy, when, when they actually... So she do, had left before. So she had just, literally just left. And I think they actually questioned Billy under hypnosis. And he remembers the very last thing that he's seen um, was Mark talking to a Hispanic man with a scar on his face. So I And I think that was under hypnosis. So he didn't even really sort of consciously remember that. 
And the police, with that information, organise a lineup of men, but Billy does not recognise any of them. So the police are trying to work against the clock. They want to round up witnesses, and they think that because of the thousands of people that were there, that sure enough, it's you know someone will have seen him. It will be yeah. easy enough for someone to remember him. But they hand out flyers and. You know, the people just, there was thousands of people there, but there were so many people. There were so many yeah, I was just hazy thinking that could go memories. Against them. Exactly. There's so many people you're not going to remember. Maybe one, one face. Yeah. Investigators at this point now believe that Mark is either dead or has been kidnapped. But, I mean, if he has been kidnapped, then why? You know, there was no ransom letter. There was no sort of indication as to why someone would want to kidnap Mark. Okay. A week later, the officers received a tip. A woman rang into the station. She was married to a Mexican police officer. She says that he bragged to her about trying to extort money from Mark. And when Mark refused, he pulled his gun on him and shot him. So this was kind of the first lead that they had. And at the time in Mexico, police corruption was pretty common. Like it wouldn't have been otherworldly for a road cop to pick you know, an easy drunk target walking around. And obviously with Mark's background, he might have looked wealthy. Okay. But well, he's not going to shoot him in a crowd. You know, there was like a crowd of people there unless he took him away in the car or something. Yeah. So the police narrow down one of their officers who had been rumoured to go rogue and is questioned. He passes a polygraph test and is cleared of suspicion and the investigation starts so again. So this was the officer married to the woman that yeah. rang in. Okay. So, you know, they're just kind of like, no, it's not him. Mark's devastated parents, James and Helen Kilroy, flew to Brownsville to lead the search. Over the next few weeks, the Kilroys mounted a determined campaign to locate their son. They circulated 20,000 leaflets throughout the Rio Grande Valley, offering a $15,000 reward for any information concerning his whereabouts. So that was a lot of, that's a lot of money now, but that was a lot of money back in those days. Yeah. And also, especially in Mexico, the minimum wage was quite low. So some people could be making as little as $2 a day. So this was considered an absolute fortune. After this is promoted, within hours, you know, there are hundreds of people um, sending in tips. Yeah. They get countless people claiming sightings of Mark in shops, on beaches, and the police had to sieve through every lead. Throughout the reports, there was a current theme of witchcraft and black magic. Right. So, Wasn't expecting that. <laughs> life in Mexico had a huge magic influence and many people across all socioeconomic spectrums either prayed to, worshipped or practiced this witchcraft. Detectives actually received a message to the police station in an envelope. It arrived and it contained a weird sentence. It just said, Mark was not the first. So, and it was like on a piece of paper that had all of these like weird drawings on it and pictures of like religious sort of cult references and crosses and stuff. So it was quite weird. Okay. The police are vaguely familiar with a gang with both a history of kidnapping and links to black magic. This was the Hernandez clan. So they smuggle thousands of tons of marijuana, cocaine and heroin to the US. Their godfather is Adolfo. Their faith is polygamy, which is a form of black magic. They believed that no one could harm him and that also that he could protect their drug smuggling process by performing this black magic. They also had a female subleader, 24-year-old Sarah Aldrete, a.k.a. the witch. So on April 21st, 1989, this was about a month after Mark's disappearance, the police are manning a checkpoint outside Metamoros when they see a truck speeding towards them. 20-year-old Serentine Hernandez, which is one of the gang members, is at the wheel driving. So he doesn't stop at this checkpoint and he speeds on past the officers. So this guy just sort of believed he was like bulletproof and invincible. So the officers decide to tail him and drive after him. He stops at a ranch about 30 kilometers outside Metamoros. 
So the officers storm the property and they just find the remains of a marijuana shipment and some handguns. So, you know, it's not a huge find or anything very significant, but they still take Seraphine in to question him because... They just don't trust him. They just think that there might be more going on. He's very smug. He's laughing and smiling. And um, they question him. And then they also decide to question the groundskeeper of the ranch. So the groundskeeper immediately recognizes a photograph on the wall. He points at it and he says that that is Mark. So the officers are like... Yes. How do you know this? Like, how do you know this guy? He said that Mark was at the ranch and he was thirsty and tied up. So I gave him bread and water. But the next day he was gone. Okay. Don't like the sound of that. No. So the police are like, what? Like, hold on a minute. Why was he there? Where is he now? You know, was he trying to buy drugs or whatever? So they question Seraphine about Mark and surprisingly straight away he's like oh yeah that's mark i know mark like he's so cocky he just doesn't even care okay he just thinks he's above everyone yes and he's like oh yeah we met mark outside a nightclub seraphine got chatting to him when he was in his car the group were on the lookout for a vulnerable american Mark was standing on his own. He was friendly and trusting and he was obviously also tipsy. And whilst he was talking to Seraphine, other members of the gang grabbed him and bundled him into the boot of their car. He was driven to this remote ranch. So they're like, what? Why did you do this to, like, why would you do this to this guy? A randomer. And he said that the abduction was under the orders of Adolfo. The Godfather. So he's just telling them all this with just literally just not without a, a care in the world. Why? It's also str- like so why is he telling them? He doesn't have to. The reason he was to be sacrificed in a demonic ritual. His life was to be drained and used to power a supernatural being that lived in a cauldron called okay. the Inganga. What? Uh, I know. Mark's life would be used to feed this demon. He was specifically targeted for being intelligent and athletic too. So, like, I don't even know where to start. The officers are obviously horrified. They race straight to the ranch, burst into the property. They enter this little windowless shack that they hadn't been into before and they smell the familiar smell of death and decay. Inside this shack... On the blood-smeared floor, amid a battery of still-glowing candles, stood an iron kettle filled with iron and wooden spikes, a shard human brain, and a roasted turtle. Other urns contained a grisly stew of congealed blood, human hair, and animal parts. Scattered about the room were coconut shells, cigars, and cane liquor, an iron bed frame, heavy electrician's tape, a blood-caked machete, and a hammer. Police also discovered a large oil drum that seemed to have been used to boil something. So one witness described the scene as a human slaughterhouse. Like, what is this even real life? Like it's making to me to boil sick. something. To boil what? <sighs> to boil a victim, I think. Seraphine explains to them what happened. So, like, brace yourself. He proudly explained to the police officers that Mark was tortured for hours. He was sodomized. Then he was made to kneel before Adolfo, where he took a machete and cut the top of his head off. He then proceeded to take out his brain and put it in the cauldron. He then cut off his arms and legs and buried him in a shallow grave. Right, seriously, who are these people? Seraphine directs the police to a patch of freshly dug earth where there is a wire sticking out of the earth. When questioned about why there is a wire there, he informs them that they inserted a wire into his spinal cord so that they could pull his bones out of the earth more easily and wear them as a necklace. What? I'm done with this story. I know, no, I know. It's like, it's so intense. And I find, why is he telling them, the police all this, like, without... He's, like I said, he's literally that cocky. So Adolfo, their godfather, is practicing this black magic, which they think in turn protects them. So he thinks, oh, nothing's going to happen to me. I'm if not going to get arrested. Yeah, he's like, it's fine. So he's ordered to dig 
him up. He still is like doesn't get the seriousness of the situation. He's laughing. He's like, do you want to get tacos after this? And when the remains are dug up, the police can tell straight away that it's Mark. You know, they can tell by like his features. And he's, Seraphine is still laughing and he's like, why are these guys getting all mad and stressed out? There's another one over there. Another what? Another body? Another body. Officers discover another 14 bodies at the ranch. All males who had been killed over a period of nine months. All people that had been used in the gang's rituals. Some of the victims had been slashed with knives, others shot, at least one had been burned, another hanged. Many had been savagely disfigured, their hearts ripped out, their ears, eyes and testicles removed. One had been decapitated. It's said that these victims were all either homeless or addicts, etc., which is why they didn't get a lot of press on their disappearance and why the gang had gotten away with this, well, so far. So a manhunt ensues to find Adolfo, Sarah Aldrete and their associates of this gang. Adolfo, who is the godfather, he stays one step ahead. He knows all of this has happened. He gets on an airplane and holds himself up in an apartment in New Mexico. So a little bit about Adolfo. Adolfo Constanzo was born in Miami, Florida in 1962. He was baptized Catholic and served as an altar boy, but he also accompanied his mother on trips to Haiti to learn about voodoo. As a teenager, he became apprenticed to a local sorcerer and began to practice a religion called Polo Mayambe, which involves animal sacrifice. That was the black magic that I was talking about. Okay. As an adult, he moved to Mexico City and met the men who were to become his followers. They began to run a profitable business, casting spells to bring good luck, which involved expensive ritual sacrifices of chickens, goats, snakes, zebras, and lion cubs. So they would make money. They would like cast spells on like drug on, like, dealers, drug dealers and drug gangs. gangs. Yes, and be like, "We will protect you by, by performing these this spells, magic," and yeah. then they pay them. Yes. Right. So they were getting rich off this as well. So Constanzo. Adolfo Constanzo then decides that they should raid graveyards for human bones to use in this poly Mayambi. So, so it started off with animals and then he's like, no, wait a and minute. And then he's like, actually, let's use human bones. Before long, they decide that the spirits of the dead would be stronger, providing them more powerful protection with live human sacrifices. So they started by digging up graves. That's not good enough for him. Animals aren't good enough. Yeah. De- graves aren't good enough. So now it's, yeah. he wants to actually kill people. So one of the other ladies that I mentioned was Sarah Aldrete. She's one of the associates and another one of the gang leader who I said that she's also known as the witch. So she leads this like bizarre double life. She's actually an honor student and a cheerleader at Texas Southmost College. She was the girlfriend of one of the drug dealers linked to the Hernandez clan. And then she met Constanzo um, in 1987. And, you know, basically she just sort of became the cult's main recruiter. Investigators believe that Sarah Aldrete's physical attractiveness and charm helped her to lure men to join the cult or to set them up to be abducted. How does that even happen? I have no idea how you go from being like an honor student and a cheerleader to like leading people into this crazy cult. To their death. To their death. Basically her, you know, her friends and people that she went to college with never suspected anything. Um, They said that she just didn't show up at school one day. She called in and said she wouldn't be coming in anymore. So this was after all this This was when this that all of those graves were discovered at this ranch. And obviously she had to get away. She had to escape and she knew that they were going to hear about this at some stage. So she said she had to work out some personal problems. And then the news reports and identified her as this like cult witch. So th- the reaction among the students and the faculty members, they were, they were shocked. They were like, couldn't believe it. It seemed impossible that this girl that they knew could be involved with this evil gang of murderous drug dealers they said that they never suspected a thing like to this day there are still people at that school 
who think that she is innocent or even just a victim of circumstance. The police, however, do believe that she took part in human sacrifice and that they said that she helped to select victims and that she also personally selected at least one victim, a man who had insulted her, lured him to the ranch and supervised a slow death that included cutting his nipples off with scissors and boiling him alive. (laughs) No, like... Like, really, really violent. So, the police decide they're going to burn this ranch and this altar and all of the cauldrons and all of the ritual stuff to the ground. They don't really give an explanation for the reason that they do this. And a lot of people sort of argue, why would they do this? Like, there's evidence mm-hmm. there. That's what I was thinking. But, th- like I said, a lot of people in Mexico at this time actually might not have practiced this sort of black magic but did believe in a lot of these things so what I imagine is that the police were actually frightened and wanted to you know get rid of all of the sort of evil spirits the evil spirits and stuff the news has reached the press at this stage footage of the burning ranch also hits the news Adolfo, who, like I said, Adolfo Constanzo, the um, godfather, he sees this footage of his satanic altar being burned to the ground on the news and he just goes berserk. He goes on this crazy rampage. He believes that the source of all of his power is being destroyed. So he starts to throw money out onto the street. So like I said, they're holed up in this apartment in New Mexico. They're four floors up. So he starts throwing all this money out and then he takes a gun and starts to shoot at people out on the street that are trying to lift the money. He's He's crazy. He's lost the... Well, he'd already lost the plot. (laughs) He's only just after losing the plot now. (laughs) (laughs) Only now. Okay, so he... By throwing his money away. I mean, who throws their money away? (laughs) After everything he's done. But like, okay... Obviously, he's he's just lost it even more at this point. And um, the police surround the building. So he knows at this point that, yes, the police the police that surround the building don't know who he is or that he's in there, but they obviously just know something's going on. But he knows that sooner or later the police are going to put it together who he is. So he orders his associates that are there to kill him. One of his associates, De Leon, he sort of hesitates. He's like, no, like I, I can't do it. But Adolfo hits him in the face and tells him that he would suffer in hell if he did not do as he commanded. He then hugs his associates and De Leon stood in front of him, opened fire and killed him with a machine gun in a closet. The rest of the associates are then arrested from there, Sarah Aldrete included. So she denies any knowledge of the sacrifices. When the police, this is also quite interesting, when they raid his New Mexico home, they find like stacks of homosexual pornography. And as with Mark's murder, like he was sodomized and they did find that in some of the other murders as well, there was like some sort of acts that they, that he might have sort of derived pleasure from. Oh, God. So in July, their trial began so um, that's Seraphine, Sarah Aldrete, some of the rest of the associates. And Seraphine describes to the court what occurred in these like really twisted rituals. Can I tell you something? Mm. I actually watched this. Even at this point, he's still smiling and smug, standing in he's court. He's like 20 years old. Yes, he's you young. So, but like, come on. <clears throat> yeah. he, he still is just like, yeah, we didn't do anything wrong. Thankfully, the jury find the defendants guilty and they are sentenced. Well, like, how could you not find them guilty? <laughs> I know. A total of 14 cult members were charged with a range of crimes, from murder and drug running to obstructing the court of justice. Sarah Aldrete and Seraphine were convicted of multiple murders and were ordered to serve prison sentences of over 60 years each. De Leon, who I said was one of the associates that actually shot Adolfo Constanze, he was given a 30-year term. So, Sarah Aldrete, if she was ever released from prison, the American authorities plan to prosecute her for the murder of Mark Kilroy in America as well. Is she still denying it? She actually wrote a book about how she had no idea what was going on and that this was all just sort of, you know, this just happened to her and how badly she was treated. Oh, please. So she, I know, she's still completely denying it. (laughs) 
<laughs> in an interview with the press, Mark's parents said that they were relieved to hear that they were sentenced. And, you know, like this poor community. Oh, my God. His poor parents, his, his friends. Poor parents, And his then friends. just, like, hearing in detail the way What happened to him. Happened, it's horrendous. It's horrendous. It's a really graphic, violent murder. Oh, you'd never. Murder and how you couldn't they, get over it. Like, how can they go on? It's, it's so it's terrible. So, you know, Mark's parents um, have actually founded the Mark Kilroy Foundation, which promotes drug awareness, education and prevention through the Just Say No campaign. So since Mark's dream was to become a doctor after college, his parents, they kind of decided to help others and continue his dream throughout this program. I feel like it's sort of such a nice way to mm. commemorate him and who he was before he was this murder victim. Yeah. You know, who he was as a person. Mark's parents also advise young people who plan to travel for spring break to suggest that they stay in groups, keep an eye on each other and not to wander off on their own. So although with this case, I think it's very easy to sort of hone in on, you know, the gangs and the black magic I think it's just really important to remember Mark, who he was as a person and everything that his parents are trying to do for him now. Yeah, in his memory. In his memory. Okay, guys, we really hope that you enjoyed this episode of What's a Crime with Gronya and Gemma. If you did enjoy, please like and subscribe. We'd be very grateful. And don't forget to tune in next week for a brand new episode. See ya. Bye.